Hello, nerds. 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 Hello, Hello, nerds. Hello, nerds. All right. Eric Ding enters the nerd zone. I've been following you on Twitter, and uh, you are definitely one of the more interesting people to follow, as well as one of the first people to kind of uh, draw attention to the coronavirus back in January when a lot of us thought, like, oh, it's this weird thing from a faraway place, like, you know, kind of like uh, swine flu or whatever, like it'll go away in a, in a few weeks. Um, but thank you for, for joining us. Uh, how are, how's your day going? No, it's good. It's good. It's crazy. Um, you know, life as an epidemiologist, it's, a, it's an interesting time to be alive. Let's just put it that way. Seriously, dude, this is like the epidemiologist, like ultimate era. I mean, you yeah. guys are at the forefront of, of uh, so many of our lives now. Yeah, well, it's it's the ultimate nightmare we're also living through, because you know, as I once said to a climate science person, um, they said, "Epidemiologists, we feel for you," and I say, <laughs> "Climate scientists, now we know how we, you guys been feeling for all these years." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they uh, I mean, certainly the the discussion of infection rates and mortality rates and comorbidities, like these are things that most Americans never really talked about. And now it's kind of a front page news. Before we go into your take on, on sort of where we're at, let's just start with a little introduction to uh, who is uh, Mr. Eric Feigelding. Um, yeah, I'm uh, I was actually a pretty normal kid. I, I was actually originally born in China. Came to the States when I was five years old. Um, grew up in uh, Nebraska, South Dakota, uh, in rural Pennsylvania. Had a very all-American you know, upbringing. And um, when not, I actually played a lot of video games, and uh, as a lot of <laughs> teenage kids did. Up until the point when I was 17, I was diagnosed with a baseball-sized tumor. Mm. And they thought I had non-Hodgkin's. And they gave me uh, less than five years to live. And that really like changed your life. And luckily the tumor, the baseball sized tumor didn't turn out to be non Hodgkin's and I survived, but uh, it was one of those things that, you know, it lit, it lit a fire in my ass and it wanted me to try to help save the world and try to really try to like focus on risk. Cause you know, it's one thing, um, when you're just a laissez-faire teenage kid, but it's totally another thing when you survive something and you become obsessed with risk. Mm. And so I went to, I went to Johns Hopkins, thought I want to be a doctor because, you know, I never even heard of epidemiology in high school as most kids have not. Um, I fell in love with epidemiology along the way. I really became obsessed with it. And I said, you know what, mom, I'm going to just, hold on to medical school for a little bit later. I'm going to go to epidemiology grad school. And it's like, to get a PhD, uh, to get a PhD, but are they paying you money? He's like, no. <laughs> so you're going to Harvard for a doctorate and they're not paying your tuition nor any stipend for a graduate degree that pays in a field that pays no money. So like, yeah, basically. So I had to kind of convince that, but um it's because I really began obsessed with it after obviously I survived my tumor, but it's one of those things where once you study epidemiology, you realize it really is the central study of all science, clinical science, public health science, any, whether clinical trials or, or anything. And so, yeah, I was just a normal kid growing up and that became really obsessed with this. I went to medical school too, but I eventually dropped out. But that's a whole nother story. (laughs) 
So you you ended up getting the PhD in epidemiology? Yeah, I got two actually. I did a dual doctoral program in epidemiology and another one because, hey, why not, um, in nutrition. And uh, I graduated both when I was 23. Wow. Look so, at you, man. Your parents must have been happy, right? Uh, semi. Or what? They wanted, they wanted <laughs> literally like a brain debt. surgeon or something? Well, I, I still have student debt. And then I still want to go to medical school. And my parents were like, you know. <laughs> That's enough. <laughs> um, but eventually I dropped out. Um, I was actually a medical student at Boston University while I was, uh, became a faculty at the Harvard Medical School. And it was kind of like it was like living this dual existence. And I realized life is about what you do, not the number of letters behind your name. So I said, you know what? I don't need medical school anymore. I just, you know, it's so about two, doing. Two PhDs was enough. Yeah, it's about doing and less, you know, just letter collecting. So what did you do after picking up that sheepskin? Um, I... Uh, I became, so I did a lot of research in you know, Harvard School of Public Health and Harvard Medical School for many years, you know, in academia for many years, doing clinical trials, behavioral research. We actually studied social networks and health. Um, but, you know, over time, I became more frustrated by the pace of science that, as you know, you can, you can publish all these studies about on climate change and about you know drinking water pollution, about healthcare, but unless you have political power, they almost you know science almost becomes like this peeing the wind kind of phenomenon. And some people didn't believe me, but now clearly you can see under Trump that the CDC is being muzzled left and right. That this only proves the point that science actually needs political power. Um, and, you know, that's actually one of the reasons I respect Andrew Yang so much. He saw that, you know, all this automation, all this structural change problems on the horizon. And the only way to change that was actually to run for office and get political power. So I actually, I ran for Congress a few years ago as well. I didn't win, wow. obviously, but. What was that um, like? It is very frustrating uh, in terms of time seeing your family and. It is a many, many hours of fundraising, mm. and uh, it is putting yourself out there. It's it's a very open kimono experience, let's just say. How much, what percent of your time do you think was fundraising? It was a decent amount. Yeah. Um, look, there's a lot of people who want to run for office. I don't <laughs> want to scare any of them. And there are things that, you, you know, once you run, you learn how the sausage factory works in terms of how many hours and let's just say I, I made enough phone calls between me and my finance assistant between our three phones you know to log several thousand calls a day so oh geez it's uh it, it's a very intense uh thing to run for office but do you, that's do you think that story for another day yeah um well let's talk about today uh what is your take on where we are with this uh, pandemic, um, you know, if you listen to the president, we've turned the corner and, or rounded the final turn and we're, we're ready to reopen. Um, what's, your, what's your sense of things? I think he's crazy. We are, as an epidemiologist, uh, the Washington Post caught me you know, make an offhand remark that, you know, epidemiologists just, just kind of want to vomit at this stage because there are, we are never even flattened the curve. The whole flatten the curve is basically you get it back down. So you mm -hmm. get like this bell curve that flattens on the other side. Um, but we never, we were, we're stuck at a high plateau and then summer came, we had another peak. Now we're at a higher plateau and now we're having a third peak uh, starting. So I don't even call the first uh, or third wave. It's it's really bad. So we're reopening schools. In many states, we're reopening bars and restaurants, which are some of the most dangerous venues. And we're nullifying 
mask mandates like they are doing in Florida and all these terrible things that you're doing and not um, also contact tracing enough. It's just so infuriating. And of course, look what happened in the white house just last week. Yeah. If you look at that, uh, that New York times chart, this is, this is the, you're saying if it were flattening of the curve, this, this point should be lower than this point, probably. Yeah, exactly. If you actually look at many other countries, they mm-hmm. actually have an upside down U in which the curve actually goes back down to baseline, mm. right? And some of them have another a spike again, but they at least got it down to baseline before they you know, try to reopen things, but we didn't never got even back down the baseline and we're reopening at higher plateaus than before. So it is just, you know, we can go into individual things like why did the CDC get overruled by the white house in terms of a public transit mask mandate? Why did the CDC get overruled when they tried to keep, um, recommend uh, cruise ships from sailing. Mm -hmm. They got overruled by that. You know, why did the CDC, uh, when it comes to asking for more contact tracing and better hospitalization get either overruled or basically, um, you know, the hospitalization data taken away from them given to the private contractor. And, And there's so many other stories of, you know, their MMR, WR reports trying to be muzzled. And it's not just the CDC. We see it also at uh, um, many other agencies. Also, Defense Production Act. We never invoked it for masks and other PPEs, which we fervently need, but we invoked it for burgers and sausages for meatpacking factories. Uh, Mm. You know, it's just so, so frustrating on so many levels. Eric, one of the things I've heard from supporters of the president is that uh, they would point to the death rate uh, being less less problematic than the case rate, uh, or saying, "Hey, look, you know that's not spiking up the number of new deaths per day, um, and that's because we have uh, better therapeutics or we know how to handle it better. So maybe it's okay if everybody gets infected." What's your mm-hmm. take on that? Uh, that is the dangerous herd immunity crap. And I want to first of all point out that herd immunity has never been a strategy for dealing with any outbreak or pandemic ever. Herd immunity is only a scientific term in the context of vaccines. That if you vaccinate enough people, um, again, via vaccines, not by infect them all, but if you vaccinate enough people, then if you get past 80%, you'll pr- protect the remaining 20 to some degree. And you get, if you vaccinate 90%, you'll protect the remaining even more. This herd immunity where, you know, if you're, if you're in a crowded room, you're on the other side, you're infected. I'm on this side, I don't have it. And if most people in the middle are immune, it creates a shield against the virus hop skipping over to me. But again, that's this is a, a vaccine phenomenon, but it's been completely abused and misused for this let's get everybody infected and build immunity for everyone, which is a very dangerous prospect without vaccines. Um, and this death rate, first of all, that graph, I want to point mm-hmm. out that cases rise first, mm-hmm. then a couple weeks later, hospitalizations, then a couple weeks later, deaths. So in June, when cases rose, you know, people were gloating, ha ha, see, no deaths. Mm-hmm. And then the hospitalizations went up. Then they said, aha, no deaths. And of course, deaths went up eventually. You know, there's this lag time. Um, and the same thing, the same thing's repeating again. Cases are going up. They're laughing, haha, no hospitalizations or deaths. Now hospitalizations right. are going up for the highest rates in over two months. And deaths will follow for sure. Now, granted, the, the death peaks may not be as high as before because we are so much better now. We know so much more about the virus per se. That's not to say that it, it is worse. We can get away with this scot-free because there's a, there's a phenomenon of long COVID. Basically, COVID ha- leading to long-term chronic conditions. 
And that is a real concern. And the CDC and the NIH actually just put out a guideline uh, just last week that says long COVID, long-term persistent symptoms of COVID is a serious issue. And it ranges depending on the population of anywhere from, you know, 30 to 80. In one study in South Korea, 90% uh, after three or four months. And that's a serious amount of, this, there's a, this is a serious issue because it could be that COVID could become like a chronic disease, like diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, right? Um, mm. And that is the main worrisome. And do kids get infected? Yes. Do kids get hospitalized? Yes. A little bit less than adults, but still, they still do. Kids do transmit. So schools are not safe entirely for them, not to mention the teachers. And young people, 20 to 30, they do get infected a lot. And the other problem is in all these countries, whether it's um, Netherlands, Denmark, Florida, a lot of these countries that if you, in the UK, actually, if you actually look at the heat map of over time, and, you know, this is a nerdy audience, so Mm -hmm. I'll explain, like, a heat map by different age groups, and as you move through time from May, June, July, August, September, October, it's always the young people, the 20 to 29-year-olds who are the leading edge. The, The epidemic of any wave in any of these countries always starts with 20, 29 year olds and then expand, the heat map expands upward. It gets hotter, more infections, and it gets older and it gets younger. Basically, the the young people may not get, in terms of die, again, they also get long COVID, chronic conditions, but they also, secondly, see the epidemic for all these other age groups. Because young people are out and about way more than, say, a 70-year-old who mostly stays home these days. Mm-hmm. And so, it A, this herd immunity is dangerous. B, it's not just death. It's also a long-term chronic thing. And C, even if you're perfectly fine, these young people, 20 to 29, 29-year-olds, are seeding the epidemic for the entire community and building up each wave. What's your sense of the people who have contracted the virus and then have recovered. Um, I was watching uh, remarks from the president a few days ago and he was saying, hey, you know, this was a blessing that I got it and now I'm immune and I feel 20 years younger and I'm stronger. He, He almost talked about it like it's a, like we should all try and get infected. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if we all had this unavailable synthetic monoclonal antibody theory from Regeneron or can all afford remdesivir, which is $5,000, uh, of course, yeah, that'd be great, you know, but not everyone can afford that. And Regeneron synthetic monoclonal antibodies are not even available Why um, currently. Other com- companies are making it, um, but they're also very extremely, extremely expensive. This is not one of those drugs it's not like vaccines where you can actually mass produce because they're actually uh, relying on these organic reactors, reactors to build these um, synthetic antibodies. Um, and the other thing is the immunity. So two things. One, Trump's immunity is not natural. There was actually a New, uh, a New York Times article that just came out yesterday. And these immunologists say, you know, the fact that he got a dexamethasone, which suppresses immunity, uh, which suppresses antibody buildup. He got eight grams, 8,000 milligrams of these Regeneron synthetic antibodies uh, in his body, which have a half-life of about 20, about like 15 or 20 days. Basically, if you have these, you're, you never taught your body how to make your own antibodies. You know, like antibodies is basically built up from your body learning to adapt to the virus. But if you got these synthetic ones, it basically replaced it and your body never evolved, most likely never evolved their own. So he may not have long-term immunity. He just has temporary synthetic immunity, which will wane. Um, And secondly, uh, there's this thing with reinfection. Reinfection are really hard to prove because it's hard to say, well, did he just never, he or she never really get over it? They could just have a, a relapse, mm-hmm. you know, the virus reactivated, it was hiding in their body. So reinfections, in order to confirm it, um, you have to basically have a genome, an RNA genome of the original infection, 
RNA genome with a new infection and compare the genomes that if they're a different virus or different enough, then it, the second one is a reinfection. And there's 23 documented cases so far. And one of the groups was actually from a WHO and Cornell University. And they actually found it happens quite a, a decent, uh, you know, not common, but still not extremely rare because they actually ran through thousands of medical records. And the other thing is of the 17 or 18 with symptoms, about half of them actually had the worse second infection than the original infection. This is all to say, A, again, herd would be crazy. B, uh, your immunity may not be that robust forever. It, not everyone is protected from a reinfection. Um, your second one may be a little worse. Um, although they actually point out your vaccine would actually be more robust actually than being infected. So again, another reason to go for vaccines strategy as opposed to a herd immunity infect them all, which by the way, ethically is also stupid. You want to infect and harm basically potentially five people or uh, four people to save one or harm four to save one. It, it just, that ratio just doesn't make sense, you know, mathematically, you know, let's just, you know, spin the roulette on all of those five people to begin with. And then hopefully then the, the last one is, is safe. It's ethically dubious as well. And again, no public health uh, folks have ever pursued this. And again, there's always a reinfection risk with um, these common infections as it is. What's your sense? I saw on Twitter that you had remarked on a Hope Hicks uh, not wearing a mask after recovering. And I was curious about that because I thought, oh, well, she had contracted it, her body fought it off. She probably has some antibodies naturally uh, occurring. Does she still need to wear a mask? Um, so first of all, the, for Trump's crowd, uh, the infectiousness on average ends about 10 days if you have a mild disease. Now, Hope Hicks is uh, just beyond the 10 days, but 10, by the way, is an average. And if you know anything about bell curves, the average is just the middle of the curve. Half the people are over it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so second of all, you know, we already covered reinfection. Reinfection does exist. And it's not just among 80-year-olds. There's plenty of people under age 40 who got reinfected as well. Um, and third of all, it sends a terrible optics message, right? Mm. Uh, that, hey, I can be nonchalant about it. You can too, right? Like this is the problem with a lot of these Trump rallies, anywhere from 80 to 90% of the people don't wear masks. And that is incredibly, incredibly worrisome, uh, especially when you see how most of these people are not socially distanced whatsoever. So when you have senior White House staff not wearing it, you know, she was next to um, Mark Meadows, Trump's chief of staff. Mm -hmm by all accounts, wasn't infected, and he wasn't wearing a mask, and none of his other staff was wearing masks. It is just incredibly bad optics, bad public health leadership. And again, I think it's so risky. Um, and by the way, Trump, the, uh, uh, because he didn't just have mild, he had serious. Him being given dexamo dexamethasone by definition makes him a serious COVID case. The WHO and CDC actually says that you could be infectious from up to 20 days after you showed symptoms. And we're not, we're beyond 10, but we're not beyond 20 days since he first got sick. So. So you, yeah. you, in that case, today was the day that Trump was supposed to debate Biden virtually, according to the Commission on Presidential Debates. And he declined because I think he said, hey, I've, I've tested negative. I don't need to uh, be virtual you think there's a chance he could still be contagious? There's, he's most likely not contagious mm -hmm. anymore. But the issue is that, A, him not wearing masks is terrible optics. Again, he's also still the tw in 20 days. There's still a small chance, he, uh, but not a big chance. And his immunity, as I mentioned, is a synthetic immunity. Mm. His body, it's kind of like 
if someone gave you um, a fish, uh, instead of teaching you how to fish, teaching your body how to fish, you would never learn how to fish. You would just, you know, basically rely on the synthetic antibodies that someone mm-hmm. gave you. And this is what's happening. And this is why a lot of scientists were really are really worried that, you know, I don't, they saying, I don't think Trump truly has natural self immunity uh, and where your body has learned directly how to make the antibody. Anyways, I think virtual should where should have been the way to go. I don't know what the hell NBC news is doing, hosting another, uh, you know, town hall interview, but uh, that's, that's for another topic. Yeah. Altogether, the, the risk of this is, 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 you know, from the beginning, I think here's the thing. There's, there's some, there's a sense called the precautionary principle where, you know, WHO made a few mistakes early on. They said, they phrase things. There's no evidence of human to human transmission. They should have said, there's no evidence yet confirming the absence of human to human transmission or, or, um, or confirming the presence of human. Basically we, they should have said, we don't know yet Mm. as opposed to, it never happens. And a couple weeks ago, a couple months ago, people were saying reinfections, they don't happen. Forget about it. But they do. And also they said, it's not airborne. Just wash your hands. Don't worry about it. But we know airborne aerosol transmission, which I feel like is the one topic is that I'm most passionate about and is least appreciated. The hand washing thing, the which is what we call fomite transmission, surface to surface contact, is actually very unimportant as a total proportion of infections. It is really the large droplets which fall down by gravity within six feet, usually, and the aerosols. And the aerosols are the main are the main mode of transmission, we actually think. But there are groups of scientists out there who are shouting, it's aerosol airborne. And the other group's like, no, hell no, it's not. But now we know, it, yes, hell yes, it is. And the, those who had shouted, hell no, it's not, and hell no, there's no reinfections, and hell no, we don't th- we don't know if there's asymptomatic transmission, if you can transmit it before you actually show symptoms. All those people have been proven wrong and deadly wrong. And with really, really massive consequences for them being wrong. Had we, you know, follow a, the South Korean approach and being extremely aggressive early on, and the Japanese approach of assuming this bug was air, it's a respiratory disease. It's not a sexually transmitted it's a <coughs> respiratory disease. They assumed that this is an airborne bug from the beginning and took every single airborne aerosol um, risk mitigation strategy. But most countries, other, especially in the U.S., did not. And here we're paying the price. And this is where the, one of those things where, you know, experts can be wrong. And people sometimes don't want to shout from the rooftop about the worst case because there is this negative connotation with being alarmist, mm. right? The, oh, you know, you're shouting fire in the, in the crowded theater. No, if you shout because you see uh, smoke in a theater, that is actually in the public interest to shout when you see smoke in a theater, right? It, it's, it's, not a, it's not a bad thing. And I think being a little bit borderline alarmist and being taking the more conservative approach. Let's just assume the virus acts and behaves the worst. Aerosol transmission, it transmits before you can even test positive, before you even show symptoms. If you show symptoms at all, you can still transmit. And, you know, all these ventilation precautions, we would be a way better spot than we are right now worldwide. One of the things that I struggle with is... uh... I remember when Fauci and others were talking about that masks don't really uh, aren't really necessary. And then at the same time, we were talking about how frontline workers were having shortages of PPE and we needed to kind of preserve supply. And I always found it like um, logically inconsistent. It's like, okay, well, if it's not necessary, then why are we scrambling to find more? Do you feel like what what was it what I, I can understand the, the the tension there because you don't want to cause a run on masks, 
But at the same time, I feel now there's a lot of people who point to those statements and say, oh, therefore, we, we don't know. Maybe masks help, maybe they don't. They change their mind. I mean, the president talks about this all the time. Yeah. And I think that's one of the, again, one of the miscommunications from the beginning. And, you know, eventually we'll need a reckoning of what went wrong. But first of all, the I think the Surgeon General, Jerome Adams, saying, you know, don't wear masks, it won't protect you, but healthcare workers needed it. It, it, it raised eyebrows from a lot of people. But at that point, we weren't ready to question everything because at that point, we still believed uh, everything was going peachy, uh, that public health had was not politically, you know, mis, uh, maligned in any way. And I think the Fauci comes from the old guard of infectious disease uh, um, and the caution, the, no, the anti-alarmist. And Fauci, I, if you follow me, I am the biggest fan of Fauci because he tells it like it is. Mm -hmm. he, is he does revise things. And one of the things was that when the aerosol scientists, which again, aerosol work, usually it does not involve virology or infectious disease epidemiology. Aerosol usually is environmental engineering, like PM 2.5, pollution levels. They don't usually work in infectious disease, but they, they've done research on this and they know it is a serious thing. And, and that this, many other viruses like this have been airborne and they've done airborne studies and they eventually approached Fauci with all of this data. And Fauci recognized that, you know, this, uh, you know, that it is an airborne bug for, for sure. And he revised and I, I give him kudos for that. If, if anything, you know, this is a name you, most people may not heard of, Matt Pottinger. He's a deputy national security uh, advisor in the Trump administration. He is the only one in the White House who's been wearing masks from day one. He used to work in China mm. and he had a lot of Chinese contacts. And so in January, late January, January 28th, he was the one who wrote a scathing, scathing warning memo. Um, I think uh, it's either the 28th or 27th. He wrote it like warning everyone that this is gonna be 1918 pandemic level bad. This was akin to my warning on January 24th, where I said, this is not just going to be any pandemic. We've had many pandemics recently, but this is going to be a pandemic for the ages that we have not seen in over 100 years since the 1918 pandemic. And he also warned that it's going to be that. And he had contacts also in China. Um, and he's, the, again, he's the only one in the White House to this day who always consistently wear masks, even to the point that he got chastised. He, at the beginning warned this and Fauci said, no, Matt's wrong. It can't possibly be that bad. And middle of February rolls around and Fauci's like, oh my God, Pottinger was right from the beginning. So I think Fauci didn't realize how bad it really was until that mid-February date as well. And a lot of the academic community, when I first rang this bell, I got a lot of, he's a scaremonger, he's a charlatan, He's an attention-seeking, you know, a maniac. And, you know, <laughs> not in any way. If anything, you know, what I, what I don't actually advertise is I actually have a, a not just my 197K Facebook page, but I actually have a 5 million person Facebook page for cancer because mm. I used to start the campaign of cancer prevention. And um, I never... We, I never posted anything about it. If I was trying to seek attention, I would have used those platforms to seek way more attention initially. But I just tweeted it from my tiny 2,000-person tw Twitter account um, back in January because this is one of those things where the academia community was not shouting about it enough. There were way too many, you know, uh, what's the word, pussyfooting about this? You know, they didn't mm -hmm. want to really go all out and try to warn the public because they were, you know, in science, you don't want to science. There's a, a tendency to move against action against any declaration. Do not conclude anything conclusively until you are absolutely certain. And Dr. Mike Ryan at WHO actually 
you know, he's he I respect him. He's a director of emergency programs at WHO. He says, you know, if you want to be perfectly right, if you want to be certain you're right before you act on anything, you will lose this pandemic. The, the you know the being perfect is the enemy of good um, in dealing with pandemic response. You know, move fast, have no regrets. It is the only way to win, and it it will save more lives in the end. And I think his his uh, his message is completely true in this in this sense. Had we moved and assumed the worst, moved with imperfect information, imperfect data, but leaning towards the fact that it could actually be as bad as the early data suggests and hints it is, we could have clamped this down so much better. Let's talk about Sweden. It at least it's been reported in the news early days that they were like, "Hey, we're not we're not doing any of this mitigation stuff." And a lot of people were thinking, "Oh, well, that's going to look really terrible, you know, a few months later." But it seems like they're doing okay. Like what's your take on how they're approaching it and and the results they're getting? Well, first of all, Sweden is not doing okay. Again, Sweden is the been held up by the right wing as this, hey, you're herd immunity. Look what Sweden's doing. Sweden is not doing that great. First of all, you, you can't compare Sweden to say UK. It's, it's they have very different healthcare systems. You know, the best comparison is Sweden and its Nordic neighbors. Norway, which used to be the same country as Sweden before they split apart. Norway, Finland, Denmark, and Iceland if you want. Um, but these Nordic countries are the closest in terms of homogeneousness and health systems. And if you look at them, you know, na- direct neighbors, mm-hmm. uh, they have about six-fold less incidence and mortality, six to ten-fold less incidence and mortality than uh, these other Nordic neighbors. Yeah, so here um, we've got Sweden on the screen, 6.5 cases, but Norway has 2.5, and then Finland has 4.3, Latvia, Estonia, two point five. Denmark, go Denmark. Underneath. Denmark, whoops. Denmark above. Germany. Denmark is tiny. <laughs> well, they have seven point one. Yeah. Now they're coming so, down, but they have more cases than Sweden. About the same. Is that is that that's the average daily cases now? Correct. The, yeah, but, but I'm talking about cumulative uh, cases and. Oh cumulative yeah, numbers. I can try and pull that up in a in a minute. Yeah, yeah, cumulative. Yeah. Look, what what what's happening now? And by the way, Sweden is also went into partial lockdown in business closures recently. So Sweden is not herd protected whatsoever because they said, oh, look, once the fall comes, Sweden will be doing so much better. No, Sweden is not doing much better. It's, it's, it's not. Yeah, I think I've got cumulative now. Here we go. Hold on. So Sweden cumulative, you've got one in a hundred people infected one in 1700 deaths and then if you go down to denmark you have a hundred one in 170 and one in eight thousand deaths so in certainly norway. yeah one about six times as many deaths yeah. in, Sweden in norway. norway norway's even less i think yeah norway one in nineteen thousand versus sweden one in one thousand so it's like yeah. 15 X. times yeah so yeah. it's quite a, yeah so sweden is not exactly the uh, perfect model of health then, huh? Yeah, no, it's not. And like right now, Europe is having a resurgence across mm-hmm. the board. And people thought that Italy and uh, France and and Spain, which were the hardest hit, it was like, they're not right. going to be hit again. No, they hit herd. They got it so bad, yes, but now they've hit herd. They can reopen their economies and they won't have out- outbreaks again. And if you look at France, Spain, Italy right now, they're bad yeah. um, as well. Um, there is no herd here. You don't get to herd until at least at least 60%. In, so it depends on the R and not. But um, and the R and not, by the way, you know, early on some people said it's like two. No. The the systematic reviews are pointing to R not being 3.5 to 4. There's even a paper that shows it was five. But it, we we definitely think it's at least three, three point five to four is, is likely the most likely range, and what that implies is the herd immunity to reach for, for that, you need a, a minimum. It's not like a linear function that as you build immunity, you know your 
your herd immunity increases. There, there's almost nothing. It's like this exponential thing where once you hit a certain threshold, it starts going up exponentially and it, it hits an acid, acid from the toe. But it only, doesn't, only starts going up around 60 and you don't really hit true herd immunity until at least 80%, 75, mm. 80% at minimum. And then above that, you know, you reach the optimal range of herd. No one's even close to that. I think worldwide, WHO estimates about one in 10 have been infected. Mm. One in 10, even if you double it for some reason, it's some, there's other um, like T cell immunity as some people are arguing, which it's hard to measure. That's still not even close to, you know, the so how does, Eric, how does this game play out? Because if you need to get to 80% for, let's call it post vaccine herd immunity, but we don't have a vaccine and a lot of people are saying they're not going to take it. Then what, what happens? Ugh, now you've gotten into the hardest part of the discussion. First of all, we need a vaccine that works. We also have to make sure it, it's, we're confident it has high efficacy and safety. And we have to make sure that the public is confident of that as well. Mm -hmm. And by rushing it as Trump, Trump is trying to do before the election, I, by the way, I think what he's going to do still is try to rush some vaccine by the late October. I, I think they're still trying to push for it. He's trying to push Pfizer for it. You know, I think this is where it becomes dangerous because you're going to shoot yourself in the foot. Look, we will have a vaccine. It will be safe. Between all the dozens of vaccines that we're working on, there's dozens of vaccines in phase three right now. Um not dozens, but I think around a dozen, 10 to 10 to 12, you know, there will be one that works for sure. And there will be, they will be safe. And some will have lower efficacy. Some will need boosters. Some uh, like the Johnson Johnson does not require, you know, cryo refrigeration, it ref basic you know, refrigeration around 35, 40 degrees is enough and long shelf life. We will have one that's effective and shelf stable and safe. But the problem is we have to wait. And the problem is, you know, these trials, they won't start finishing until late November, early December, before we get results and probably, you know, probably December and January. Um, and then mass production ramp up, all these things take time, we might have a few million doses, 10 million doses early on, for frontline healthcare and essential workers. But we're not, it's not going to be mass available until late spring and summer next year. So now in terms of, you know, how to ultimately beat this, yeah, vaccine is the ultimate strategy. And vaccines pr actually, pr again, I want to emphasize the immunologists are all saying the vaccines provide more robust immunity than if you were just infected alone. So um, we're hopeful. We're hopeful. But, you know, we just need a lot of people infected because in certain ways, even if you have a 100% effective vaccine, but 50% refuse to take it, it's, just, it's, it's almost analogous to a 50% effective vaccine, right? Mm -hmm. um, and similarly, let's just assume the early vaccine is, I'm going to guess a ballpark of 50 to 70%, say, it's 50, uh, say 60, but then half the people don't initially take it. That's akin to a 30% effective vaccine, 60 divided by two, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's, and then you add in uh, the baseline immunity, let's just say right now it's 10%. So maybe it's 15% by next early next year. Mm -hmm. You still get, you know, 15 plus 30, assuming 50% of people take it, a 60% effective vaccine, you only still get to 45%. That's not enough, you know. It'll slow down the spread. It'll spread slower, but it won't end it, you know. Um, so Let me I share with you, Eric, a, a story I heard from a friend of mine who was doing some business in Taiwan, and he just came back to the Bay Area, and he was saying, like, uh, that he can go to restaurants, that they that they're going to the office like it's they they have to wear masks they're they're taking temperatures a lot they're disinfecting hands or they're having some separation but it's not a full lockdown over there at least from what i understood and i wonder like 
in the U.S., we seem to talk about full open or full lockdown. Is there some middle ground that we can kind of uh, make more sustainable and still have like a safe environment? Yeah, that, that this lockdown problem. Lockdown is not the uh, final solution whatsoever. It's not a long term solution until we get a vaccine either. You know, lockdowns is more like it cool. It's a it buys you time. Mm. It, but what you're supposed to do in a lockdown is buys you time to contact trace, buys you time that any hot spots can cool by quarantine. Basically, it's a mass quarantine, right? By making them everyone isolated at home, it can cool down the epidemic to a level that you can manage and trace because we don't have good contact tracing like we have in Asia, and we don't have good enforcement. You know, like uh, different countries in Asia, basically, if you travel anywhere, um, they have these, you know, inter-country, you know, quarantine rules. You can't quarantine someone from Florida going to New York right now. That's, it's it, it, theoretically, you're supposed to. But if you just drive up to New York, they can't stop you from crossing the border or monitor you. All these things where if we had done a really good lockdown, and we our lockdowns are loosey-goosey, let's just say. And if you look at some of these rules, lockdown rules, it's like half a page of lockdown rules, two or three pages of exemptions. Mm. And basically, oh, if you feel like you need to visit your family member, go ahead. If you feel like you need to go out, um, you know, go to the park, and which is fine. But if you feel like you need to do all these different things, take care of family members, or if you work as a babysitter, you know, it's okay. Like all these things where if you look at what China did, if you look at what all these other countries are extremely aggressively did, testing, mass testing, mass aggressive uh, contact tracing, super aggressive quarantining, and super tight regulations and movement, super good, um, you know, mask wearing, Super uh, tight, uh, um, you know, improvements in air, airborne infection spread by assuming the worst that's airborne aerosol. All these things, had we done all those and did their super tight lockdowns, we would not have the same problem. But the U.S., a, we're much more loosey-goosey. We don't have these good tight quarantines, tight con- contact tracing, fast quarant- contact tracing, uh, so, and you know our testing came late. Our, again, our lockdowns are very poor. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a it's a continuous whack a mole. And I, I say the whack a mole. Think of like this. See, every state is is like a leaky ship. So we have a sh- one big ship with fifty holes, right? Mm-hmm. And even if five or ten or half the states are super good on their containment. But we, you can't bulkhead off the different compartments of the ship, the different states. Then the ship will still continue to take on water, right? Be- basically, a mm-hmm. one hole with no bulkhead to seal off that ball- leaky part of the ship, the ship, the entire ship will continue to sink, even if certain states are really, really good at this. And that is what's happening in the U.S. right now. And some of this, these states are have, you know, Open bar restaurants, no masks, sc- schools reopening, schools not, you know, contact tracing enough, not enough any community contact tracing. Here we are. This is inherently the problem of what we're suffering. And, you know, you, you can, M- Massachusetts can be as good as it can be about it. Maryland is actually really good. Um, and New York was super tight. But, the loosey goosiness and this epidemic continues to spread. And by the way, New York, its epidemic uh, was mostly um, driven in these orthodox conservative uh, communities um, who are really, really flagrantly violating a lot of distancing and aerosol and mask wearing rules. And all the epidemics originally started in there in New York City. And now New York, New York has a, uh, a small runaway epidemic again, potentially. So um, this is this is the inherently problem. You know, yeah, we don't have a unified system. 
it seems like the national mitigation is only as effective as the weakest implementation. And there's some exactly. parts where there's just nothing going on. Yeah. Like it's, any it's, leak yeah. continues to sink the whole ship. Now there was an argument earlier in the year that, um, Hey, New York, Seattle, these are like uh, concentrated cities. They're very diverse. There's all these people from Asia f- flying in. Yeah. Places like uh, Wisconsin, North Dakota, they, you know, th- that you can't apply uh, one set of rules. Uh, you are a very diverse country. I think that's been proven wrong now, right? Because uh, there oh, yeah. are parts of the country that are really hit hard. Yeah. Uh, if we call our, instead of waves, we call them peaks. The first peak was, you know, New York, New England, mm-hmm. a little bit of Louisiana, and, and Seattle, and California. The second peak was Texas, Arizona, Florida, the entire southern U.S., Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, right? Mm-hmm. And now it, the third peak is really a lot of these Midwestern, upper upper plains and upper mountain states, South Dakota, North Dakota, Wisconsin. The Dakotas are just on an absolute tear. If you actually if you actually bring up the South Dakota and North Dakota. Um, epidemic rates they are among the high if each country were their own country in the world south south and north dakota and wisconsin would be three Mm. of the highest countries in the world if they were if they were uh, epidemics yeah as a country it is insane right now um and again a lot of iowa nebraska a lot of these hot spots yeah. Um, if you look at a per capita basis and people saying, well, you know, at the beginning, well, it's a New York City thing because, you know, it's a high density thing. No, it's not a just a city thing. It is. It can definitely hit rural America. And these rural America is actually less ready. New York City has a lot of hospitals, actually, and a lot of doctors, a lot of ICU beds. These other places do not. Wisconsin yeah. had to create uh, like their own emergency field hospital. But some of these areas are just absolute, yeah, even Iowa, nice. crazy. Oh yeah, Iowa. A, a lot of the meatpacking plants. Mm. It, it, it's becoming this like upper plains, uh, upper uh, northwest, uh, midwest. Um, up, not upper northwest, upper midwest um, epidemic, and it's really bad because our team at FAS, Federation of American Scientists, where I'm a senior fellow. If if you actually look at them. Uh, when we did this tabulation of these states, these states are some of the highest in the entire world if they were countries. And I can't, I can't even, and a lot of these states just do not have mask mandates, are forcing schools to reopen. Actually, I was in the middle of a battle with the Des Moines City on public schools. Des Moines doesn't want to reopen schools. Iowa basically is, is basically forcing them to reopen or they're going to, not pay them Um, Mm. and they're going to run their own deficit uh it's really terrible situation all around eric i know we're running a little over time i i want to ask you one last thing because i've seen this um being shared around on social media a lot there's these videos of people uh wearing a mask and then vaping and then showing like all of this uh this uh you know uh fumes or whatever coming out of the mask and saying hey look it doesn't really protect you you know don't be afraid don't be a sheep um you know it's not it doesn't make a difference uh what, what's your what's your have you seen that and what or heard about this kind of narrative yeah i i've briefly seen that i'm actually not just pro mask i'm pro you know premium masks because the premium masks catch way more than um, these cloth masks. And the other thing is cloth masks don't protect you from inhalation. They catch these droplets. If everyone around you wears masks, then the cloth masks have benefits. Everyone has uh, protection. But if half the people are not wearing that mask, then your cloth mask is not going to protect you that well. Uh, so in that sense, I'm actually advocating for double masking and wearing premium masks, not just a single cloth mask. And, and when you say premium, wear, is that like the N95 type or a premium? I'm just, there's super premium and there's regular premium. <laughs> there, surg- by premium, I mean surgical masks mm-hmm. at minimum. And then uh, KN95s. But the problem is there's a lot of fake KN95s. And that's the other thing. 
Um, you can't tell directly, but K these fake KN95s sometimes have less than 95% filtration. Um, they actually have like 20 or 30% if, if you have fakes. So it could also be that there's a lot of fake KN95s. I wear a KN95 and a, a South Korean KF94. I actually really like it because South Korean KN94 goes around your face and gives you much more space. Hmm. So you can actually breathe and you know, use your lips and not actually mm -hmm. touch your mask uh, when you wear it. Um, I, I, anyways, I, I double mask whenever I have to go indoors in some common place. And the definition, these 95 means they still release some, mm -hmm. right? They're, they're not meant to catch all. Uh, and the other things, most of the viruses, some, there's other misconceptions. The virus is technically smaller than the filtration. Yes, that is technically true, but the virus never travels naked. The virus is almost always part of a droplet, either a large droplet, you know, mm -hmm. large droplet being the ballistic kind where it gets pulled down by gravity. But the micro droplets, aka aerosols, the micro droplet aerosols are, um, they're still attached to something, you know, and like fog, by the way. A fog is one of those, you know, 15 micron uh, things where, you know, they, 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 can you breathe in fog and smoke? Yes, it's possible, but it still gets filtered out a lot and it stays airborne. Um, so there's a lot of, it does have filtration for things that are um, uh, a um, airborne aerosol and even if the virus is a little bit smaller than technically the filtration dimension, the virus is always attached to something, dust yeah. or a droplet of moisture, which makes it bigger uh, and with filterable. And we know it, it works. It really does work because they've actually done studies of, of guinea pigs or hamsters and one is infected or they put like um, uh, these infectious particles near it and if you separate them by this surgical mask barrier, surgical mask material barrier, the other uh, hamsters and guinea pigs don't get sick. But if you don't use the surgical mask barrier, the other hamster guinea pigs do get sick. <laughs> it's, it's as it clear as night and day, right? Um, mm -hmm. So there are many studies that do show it works. And we're pretty confident it works, even if there's still leakages. Yeah. It certainly seems like it's working in parts of Asia and Japan and whatnot, and they're not all like completely wrapped up head to toe. It, I guess part of it is also if enough people participate, then even if it's an imperfect mitigation, it still does enough to avoid like massive spikes. But this is where when half the country just is really indignant on not doing it and the president isn't setting a great example i mean he's he's uh kind of trying to convince people i think that we're we're out of the woods we're not yeah. this fall and winter is going to be much worse it's going to be bad um because the final word is it's bad in the winter time mostly because there's less outdoor activity more indoors mm -hmm. and the more you do indoors because and the more you close the window because it's cold outside the more aerosol transmission there will be that is the simple simple fact of this virus and most respiratory viruses that's why we have way more uh, outbreaks in the winter time yeah so everyone just mind and assume that the virus is airborne which it is and assume it is airborne, even if you don't see it and around, uh, if you're not around someone. Because if, if you use a bathroom and the toilet plume from the previous person is flushed into the air and they've gone, been gone for five, ten minutes, the virus can still be in the air, even if you don't see the previous person. They were long gone. So that's why you have to really assume that the virus is everywhere, especially indoors, in public places. Well, that's a sobering conversation, uh, Eric. I, I appreciate you keeping it real and uh, not pulling any punches. And I mean, certainly you were right in January when a lot of people thought that uh, this would just come and go and it would 
you know, miraculously disappear. disappear. Um, so hopefully uh, people will listen more this time. Yeah. Let's stay safe, everyone. <laughs> oh my god all right well let's wrap with this eric are there it sounds like if i had to summarize some of the tips are get serious about wearing a mask assume that it is aerosol and that you can't see it even if there's no one around um and then what what do social distancing is that probably something you think is is worth pursuing or i think it's still worth pursuing of course um it's 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 a it's more like a Swiss cheese multi-layer defense system. Mm. You can't like white house relied on just testing. And then if, if you test negative, Hey, everyone can go without masks. No, you should rely on the testing. Assume some will slip through rely on distancing. Assume some will slip through rely on masks, you know, and assume that, you know, maybe a small amount may get through the mass through the edges of your, of your face or through your eyes. You know, take every precaution you can. And the more precautions you can take, the probability just keeps dropping and dropping and dropping, right? And this is, you just have to take a mathematical statistical chance. It's it's like your, your chance of winning a poker game, or chance of winning anything increases the more you prepare for it, right? Yeah. And... That's really have to play the statistical odds. If there's so many people here, don't go there. If a lot of people are not wearing masks here, don't go there. And it's again, the more layers of things you can do to protect yourself, double mask, premium masks, the more you're protected. Thank you very much, Dr. Ding. We'll have to uh, have you back on, uh, hopefully in the, maybe uh, after the new year, and we can sure. talk. We can talk about if there is a vaccine approved by then, and how things are looking, and what the data tells us. Uh, it sounds like we should buckle up because it's going to be pretty intense this winter. Yeah, it will be. It will be. So look forward to it. hopefully, hopefully everyone stays safe until then, and uh, you know we will survive. But the issue is how well. So take everyone take care of themselves. All right. Well, with that, we're going to say goodbye, nerds. Goodbye, nerds. Take it easy. <laughs> I love it. Yang gang, 2020. Yang gang, 2020. Yang gang, 2020. Yang gang, 2020. Yang gang. Yeah, yeah. Yang gang, 2020. Yang gang, 2020. Yang gang, 2020. Yang gang. Yeah. I want a thousand a month. A thousand a month. I want a thousand a month. A thousand a month. Let's get this spread. Freedom dividend. Are all y'all paying attention? Automation gonna sweep the nation. Unless we get him in. Andrew Yang, 2020 freedom dividend. Yang gang, 2020. Yang gang, 2020. Yang gang, 2020. Yang gang, yeah, yeah. First we get this money, then on 420. He gonna give some high fives to some high guys. Decriminalize marijuana so we can smoke, smoke if we wanna. Down with the opioid trend, up with the mental health thing, yeah. Math, yo, it's just math. Yo, it's simple math. Yo, can you? Do math, yeah, yeah. Eliminate super packs. Color stars making stacks. Student loan forgiveness plan. Thank you. Cops wearing cameras and. Climate change is real again. Science rules. Teachers bringing home some bread. Medicare for every citizen. That's nice. Andrew Yang, 2020 freedom dividend. Yang Gang, 2020. Yang Gang, 2020. Yang Gang, 2020. Yang Gang. Yeah, yeah. Yang Gang 2020 Yang Gang 2020 Yang Gang 2020 Yang Gang Yeah, yeah